Ezra chapter 5 Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jozadak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. At that time, Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozanai, and their associates went to them and asked, Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and to finish it? They also asked, What are the names of those who are constructing this building? But the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews, and they were not stopped until a report could go to Darius and his written reply be received. This is a copy of the letter that Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozanai and their associates, the officials of Trans-Euphrates, sent to King Darius. The report they sent him read as follows. To King Darius, cordial greetings. The king should know that we went to the district of Judah to the temple of the great God. The people are building it with large stones and placing the timbers in the walls. The work is being carried on with diligence and is making rapid progress under their direction. We questioned the elders and asked them, Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and to finish it? We also asked them their names, so that we could write down the names of their leaders for your information. This is the answer they gave us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, one that a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our ancestors angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean king of Babylon, who destroyed this temple and deported the people to Babylon. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. He even removed from the temple of Babylon the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to the temple in Babylon. Then King Cyrus gave them to a man named Shezbazar, whom he appointed governor, and he told him, Take these articles and go and deposit them in the temple in Jerusalem, and rebuild the house of God on its site. So this Shezbazar came and laid the foundations of the house of God in Jerusalem. From that day to the present, it has been under construction, but is not yet finished. Now, if it pleases the king, let a search be made in the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did in fact issue a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision in this matter. Ezra chapter 6 King Darius then issued an order, and they searched in the archives stored in the treasury of Babylon. A scroll was found in the citadel of Ekbatana, in the province of Media, and this was written on it. Memorandum In the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. Let the temple be rebuilt, as a place to present sacrifices, and let its foundations be laid. It is to be sixty cubits high and sixty cubits wide, with three courses of large stones and one of timber. The costs are to be paid by the royal treasury. Also, the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, are to be returned to their places in the temple in Jerusalem. They are to be deposited in the house of God. Now then, Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozanai, and you other officials of that province, stay away from there. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I hereby decree what you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of this house of God. Their expenses are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of Trans-Euphrates, so that the work will not stop. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, male lambs for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, and wheat, salt, 
wine and olive oil, as requested by the priests in Jerusalem, must be given them daily without fail, so that they may offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. Furthermore, I decree that if anyone defies this edict, a beam is to be pulled from their house, and they are to be impaled on it. And for this crime, their house is to be made a pile of rubble. May God, who has caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or people who lifts a hand to change this decree or to destroy this temple in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have decreed it. Let it be carried out with diligence. Then, because of the decree King Darius had sent, Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Shethar Bozanai and their associates carried it out with diligence. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, a descendant of Edo. They finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles, celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred male lambs, and, as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem, according to what is written in the book of Moses. On the fourteenth day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The priests and Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their relatives, the priests, and for themselves. So the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it, together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days they celebrated with joy the festival of unleavened bread, because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria, so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. 2 Chronicles chapter 32 After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib king of Assyria came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come, and that he intended to wage war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military staff about blocking off the water from the springs outside the city, and they helped him. They gathered a large group of people who blocked all the springs and the stream that flowed through the land. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find plenty of water, they said. Then he worked hard, repairing all the broken sections of the wall and building towers on it. He built another wall outside that one and reinforced the terraces of the city of David. He also made large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square of the city gate and encouraged them with these words, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria, and the vast army with him, for there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah the king of Judah said. Later, when Sennacherib king of Assyria and all his forces were laying siege to Lachish, he sent officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah king of Judah and for all the people of Judah who were there. This is what Sennacherib, king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing your confidence that you remain in Jerusalem under siege? When Hezekiah says, The Lord our God will save us from the hand of the king of Assyria, he is misleading you to let you die of hunger and thirst. 
Did not Hezekiah himself remove this God's high places and altars, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, You must worship before one altar and burn sacrifices on it? Do you not know what I and my predecessors have done to all the peoples of the other lands? Were the gods of those nations ever able to deliver their land from my hand? Who of all the gods of these nations that my predecessors destroyed has been able to save his people from me? How then can your God deliver you from my hand? Now do not let Hezekiah deceive you and mislead you like this. Do not believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my predecessors. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? Sennacherib's officers spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. The king also wrote letters ridiculing the Lord, the God of Israel, and saying this against him, Just as the gods of the peoples of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. Then they called out in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall, to terrify them and make them afraid in order to capture the city. They spoke about the God of Jerusalem as they did about the gods of the other peoples of the world, the work of human hands. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel, who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib king of Assyria and from the hand of all others. He took care of them on every side. Many brought offerings to Jerusalem for the Lord and valuable gifts for Hezekiah king of Judah. From then on he was highly regarded by all the nations. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord, who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond to the kindness shown to him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem, Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had very great wealth and honor, and he made treasuries for his silver and gold and for his precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of valuables. He also made buildings to store the harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil, and he made stalls for various kinds of cattle and pens for the flocks. He built villages and acquired great numbers of flocks and herds, for God had given him very great riches. It was Hezekiah who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon Spring, and channeled the water down to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he undertook. But when envoys were sent by the rulers of Babylon to ask him about the miraculous sign that had occurred in the land, God left him to test him, and to know everything that was in his heart. The other events of Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are written in the vision of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Hezekiah rested with his ancestors and was buried on the hill where the tombs of David's descendants are. All Judah and the people of Jerusalem honored him when he died, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. Psalm 11 In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, Flee like a bird to your mountain, for look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous. 
but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulphur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. Proverbs chapter 6 My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart, he always stirs up conflict. Therefore disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart, fasten them round your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way to life, keeping you from your neighbor's wife, from the smooth talk of a wayward woman. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty, or let her captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. For jealousy arouses a husband's fury, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will not accept any compensation. He will refuse a bribe, however great it is. <laughs>